Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Premier Pundit podcast. Happy New Year, a belated Happy New Year. It's been a while, but the fixture gods haven't been kind. The games are coming thick as fast, but we're back, myself and my esteemed co-host, to look ahead to those fixtures in game week 18 and trying to navigate that minefield, that minefield that lays ahead of us. Mr. McKenna, how are you? How was the new year? Are you fully refreshed? Are you excited to be back in the hot seat? Yes, I'm very excited. And I don't know if people can see that we're already making some chopping and changes. So the content coming out soon will be exciting. We're going to be out there as much as possible, looking as good as possible already. I mean, we looked great already we just wanted the content to, to look as good as us basically um, but the, the interesting thing is that it has been thick and fast and so it's it's meant that we've not been able to react as easily as we work behind the scenes on some of this stuff but on the flip side it gives us a lot to talk about but we're going to keep these kind of discussions shorter from now on so tonight's episode is going to be about 30 minutes, 45 minutes just of, you know, the traditional FPL stuff. But through the week as well, make sure to like, subscribe, share with friends to keep in the loop because we're going to have a, quite a bit of content coming out, exclusive interviews with some big people, but also great analysis, data, tactics, and, of course, injuries for the weeks ahead. And also by liking, subscribing, and sharing, you'll also be able to get involved in some of the competitions that we do like we did with Anand Ben, one of our great, great fans. He was very happy, wasn't he, with that? He was over the moon. Come as a total shock, out, out of the blue. A nice little Christmas present for the young fella. Uh, and it just goes to show, you know, uh, we're rewarding our loyal followers. Um, you know, he, he's he's a guy that tunes in for all of our shows, live Q&As on, on Hot Mike. Um, and he's always, you know, putting in worthwhile comments and, and really giving some good insight and opinion. So, and that's what we love. You know, that's what we're, that's what we're here for. We love to engage with the audience and it just gives a different perspective on how things are going and, and also allows us to sort of connect and, um, you know, be in tune, you know, with, with, with what people are, are watching and what people want to know about. Yeah. And, and we want people to, to get involved. So obviously tonight, this one isn't live. It, it was kind of uh, a bit like the Fulham match. We weren't even sure this one was going ahead. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later as well. But, you know, normally we do these bigger podcasts live just because we want people to get involved. So keep an eye on the YouTube live because we're going to be utilising that very soon. But we've both got five points each to go through. We're going to be chopping and changing quite a few of these important topics. But the big, big one this week is... You know, it's a bit like Macbeth, to free hit or not to free hit. That is the question. And just like Macbeth, you know, it's do or die. It is a life or death situation. And, you know, sometimes I do feel like I should be talking into a skull right here because that would probably make a lot more sense than what is going on in the community at the moment. But my plans have been a little bit scuppered, Ben. Uh, we'll get on to yours in a sec, but just to explain quickly... I had carefully created my team that I'd have about nine or ten players playing this game week. I was happy to miss out on one or two. I had enough coverage. And then all of a sudden the news came in about Aston Villa and the, the Tottenham game. I thought originally that was going to be totally postponed and Tottenham weren't going to play. Then Fulham have come into the fold and, and it's changed things a lot you know Graylish was a big player Martinez is one of your um uh, is sorry is one of the people in the community that the community have held on to for this very reason so that's really gone against the the kind of people like myself who were going to go don't need to free hit this week so at the moment my thinking and and of course we're leaving this right to the deadline as always is to free hit because the data is showing that 60% of active managers will be doing that. I'm already on a minus four for the team. Uh, I did uh, two changes this week. And so if I do anything more, at the moment I only have eight players playing, but I feel a bit annoyed that I'm basically free hitting for maximum two, three players to, to, to bring it up to 11. 
and it just feels like a waste of it when I could use it a little bit later in the season. So Ben, I'm still on the fence. Have you changed your point of view on this very big conundrum for the community? Um, look, I've, I've stumbled, stumbled into this game week quite fortuitously. I would like to say that, you know, I planned well in advance and I, you know, I had one eye on, on this this game week and then the, the double that will quickly follow on its heels um, at the forefoot of my mind when I was making selections. But the reality of the situation was I was never really that keen on, on doing so because of the situation with regards to COVID, injury, the potential of suspension in and around this this hectic fixture period that we've had over Christmas and New Year. Um, so I've stumbled into to 10 players that I've got currently and I've also got a, a transfer in the bank. So all being well, I can go into this game week with 11, uh, hopefully with 11 starters. Um, so no need to take a hit and no need to use any chips. Now, uh, all well and good for game week 18, but maybe it's not so good looking ahead to, to game week 19. And, you know, but um, I feel as if I'm in, in, in quite a good position. Um, the Tottenham game helped because I am a Harry Kane owner. Um, the other one, you know, I only really missed out on, on Martinez, but he wouldn't have started anyway because he's in the bad books. Um, and Ross Barkley, who was, you know, Dean Smith had earmarked Ross Barkley from return. Chances are it might only be the point of the bench at best. But, you know, because Dean Smith has been talking about Ross Bartley potentially returning for at least a, a couple of weeks now. Um, so, But that's been taken out of my hands. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy and comfortable. It's just a case of who do I get rid of this game week to, um, you know, to up my quota to 11 for game week 18. And so we'll come to that at the end of the show. We'll reveal our transfers and our plans for that. Uh, well, you know, th there's quite a bit to get onto. So, Ben, do you want to introduce your first topic of conversation today? We've gone into the free hit or not to free hit, but is there a team or a player or just a topic that you really need to cover because it's going to affect game week 18? Um, look, I think we'll do, I, I might address the elephant in the room, and it's, I've just been had the conversation with it literally within the last half an hour, and that's that this this late rearranged fixture, um, you know, in consultation with the Premier League and the FA, to um, you know, Aston Villa weren't able to fulfil their fixture with Tottenham on Wednesday evening, um, which has meant a, a, you know a slight reshuffle for the first time, an unprecedented move uh, in Fulham being thrown in there, um, you know, to try and uh, negate any potential fixture pile-up or congestion period further down the line. And, um, you know, there's been no official comment from Fulham, but generally, the, the, you know, the media reports suggest that, that Fulham are, are pretty fuming at the fact that they've been almost strong-armed into playing this game. Um, and you're going to get that. You know, I've had an interesting conversation. We have content which will come out and, and sort of reflect maybe a general mood, but also maybe the thought process of what's going on behind the scenes with regards to, you know, not necessarily what you would see as a supporter or maybe even just a member of the, of the media about, you know, how Scott Parker will be you know, looking at this window to, to prepare his players for the next league game, you know, thinking that, you know, you've maybe got seven, eight or nine days or, or, or whatever it was and then all of a sudden all of those, you know, the best made plans it's thrown into turmoil. There may be things which are going on behind the scenes which you're not aware of. You know, so Scott Porter and his backroom staff are probably managing players, managing situations which will never see the light of day outside of that football club. And let's not forget you know, Fulham are fighting for their lives in the top flight. You know, they Every game counts for them. Every point matters when you're scratching around at the bottom of, you know, the Premier League. And Scott Parker wants to ensure that, you know, if Fulham are going to battle, you know, they want to be as, as, as best prepared as possible. And quite rightly so. Um, and depending on which way you want to look at it, you know, they may feel that as, 
you know, uh, Jose Mourinho, big personality, Tottenham, a club of big stature, or the FA and the Premier League maybe bending to the might of Mourinho and Tottenham over, you know, they're, they're slightly sort of lesser neighbours across in West London, Fulham. And um, just so to, an interesting one. Just to, to jump in there, Ben, but do you genuinely think that there is an advantage to Tottenham and uh, a problem towards Fulham there? Just, just like a quick summary on your thoughts and feelings, because I do urge people to look into the brilliant podcast that you've done with Lee Taylor, but just a quick summary of, you know, the benefit to Tottenham and is it a bad thing for Fulham or, or is this narrative overplayed? Uh, look, it's a, it's a difficult situation to, to ascertain. Um, there's a suggestion that Scott Faulkner wouldn't have went with the team that he did down at, uh, at QPR at the weekend in the FA Cup. I think they made seven changes. There was some suggestion that he, you know, he, he wouldn't have maybe tinkered with his side so much. Um, it now brings into the question that you've got, I've got three games in a week, um, and and maybe that might have had a, a way in his thinking. We just don't know at the minute. You, you know, yeah, yeah, we're speculating. Um, as footballers, you know, you should be prepared to play. You know, that's your job. You know, you, we're talking about a forty-eight hour notice. Well, really, you know. It, we decided we're going to do a podcast within half an hour, 45 minutes. That's what we do. That's our job. You know, you get your head in the game and you get on with it. However, you, you are managing different personalities within the game as well. And you talk about maybe these quick turnarounds between games. You talk about players who are coming off the back of COVID-related absence, which we still don't know a lot, a lot about. You know, hamstring injury, grade one, you maybe talk in 10 to 21 days. Uh, groin injury, grade two, you may be talking two to three months. COVID, you could be talking 10 days. You could be talking six weeks plus, like some of the Newcastle, or also some of those players in Europe who are, are literally ruled out for a minimum of three months. So they're still carrying the, the, the after effects of that. Again, some of which you know we may never get to hear about. And it's, it's, it's the preparation at the highest level. It's those... Um, those finite shifts, those little, um, you know, it's that 1% that can cost you a game or, you know, bring home three points. Um, and, you know, Scott Parker may feel a little aggrieved that, you know, this is not ideal and he would have liked a little bit more time to prepare. But uh, on the flip side of that, does that maybe enforce this, you know, the siege mentality? Um, you know, well, Everybody's against us. We've been forced into this. I tell you what, let's go out there and let's get a result. Let's put in a performance. And for all of those in the community who are thinking, I tell you what, this looks like a tasty fixture on paper. Let's steam in to some of their big Tottenham assets. I wouldn't be so sure because Fulham have looked a lot better of late. They're looking a lot more solid defensively. They're looking finally as if they've adapted to playing in the top flight. Um, and look, I expect a, a really tough game and certainly not the, the, the walkover that maybe some are suggesting. Yeah, and that brings me nicely onto my point that I was going to bring up is that we'll get on to captaincy selections as well a little bit later. But in terms of actually Fulham themselves, I think this, this narrative of them being the whipping boys is kind of over now. And looking at the stats tables, there's two thoughts going in here first and foremost Tottenham aren't like they were at the start of the season Kane and, and Son are, are ticking along nicely they're probably giving good value for for their money and I'm kind of in the band now of you own e either or you don't own both uh, I think you know looking at Fernandez or even Kevin De Bruyne from the fact that Kevin De Bruyne has got a double game week and Son does not that makes it more enticing for me. But factoring the the point and the data that Tottenham have not been as tacking as they once were at the start of the season, tactics have changed a little bit. But also maybe there is man management for Mourinho and the fact that he doesn't want to go out there and, and exhaust his players because they've got so much on their plate. The flip side for me is the fact 
that Fulham have managed two clean sheets in the last six game weeks, but their XG conceded is just 3.87, and they've only conceded two goals as well. Big chances conceded, they are second best in the league over the last six game weeks. Uh, their XG conceded is sex, uh, second best over the last six game weeks. Goal attempts conceded their best in the league over the last six game weeks. And then goal attempts in the box conceded, which is a great measure for the quality of chances they're conceding. You know, a shot in the box is a very powerful one. They're top again, beating the likes of Manchester City, who everybody's waxing lyrical about. I will keep a keen eye on this kind of trend because it does make me think, well, there might be some bargains in the Fulham back line. But for this game week, in terms of captaincy choices, it makes me very worried because I think, well, I can't trust in Kane now because the game weeks that I have trusted in him, he's blanked or not scored as highly as somebody like Fernandez. And the fact that Fulham have turned this corner, they're coming into this game with a little bit of rest. Obviously, they played 120 minutes midweek, uh, sorry, at, at the weekend in the FA Cup. But to the same extent, they, they do have that little bit of rest in them, which Tottenham haven't. And I, I'm just very, very concerned, Ben. And the, the captaincy will not be going on Kane this week. It's, it's a big worry. I mean... What are your thoughts and feelings uh, on that situation, Ben? Um, well, the captaincy decisions obviously taken out of my hands, and the fact that I've got me set for getting Marcus Rashford, and these are this is one of those situations where you know what? It's almost a relief that I don't have to worry about captains. I don't have to overthink things. It's done and it's dusted. But I would be very hesitant to go down the route of a Harry Kane. Although, you know, I'm a big fan. I've been with him since uh, Project Restart. And, um, you know, there's undoubted his quality. But I just think with the scene of return, of, um, Fulham's upturn seemed to coincide with um, Anderson coming into that back line. You know, from his injury, he was he was a summer signing, injured uh, in training. I think one of his first sessions without making a performance, but he's came in, you know, it's been pretty seamless. Um, Scott Park has changed things up a little bit. We're now seeing uh, Loftus Cheek getting a little bit more game time. We've seen even Reed drop into that almost that right attacking wing back role um, and get himself on the score sheet a couple of times. The, the interchanges that them hold the midfielders with Harrison Reed and Lamina um, and, uh, and, uh, and Guisa. You know, there's, that, that's the three. And everybody before ball had been kicked. We were all looking towards Mitrovic as a, as a potential budget option in that attack. Hasn't had a sniff. Um, you know, Cavalero um, seems to be making that spot. He's, we've even actually seen Loftus Cheek playing there as almost a, a false name as well. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how Mitrovic, or how Scott Parker, Manages the situation with regards to the Mitrovic and his breaking of the, um, you know, the the lockdown protocol or, or regulations or governance over the new year because he was um, quite rightly so he was he was singled out by Scott Parker who expressed his um, major disappointment at, at what he had seen of breaking of those rules or flouting of the rules or, um, and yeah you know if if that sort of translates to 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 game time on the pitch, you know, uh, we've seen managers looking at, at other players. I mean, he, he was spotted with uh, Mary Bojevic, but and, and Roy Hudson sort of, I don't know, you know, uh, I know it's a difficult situation, but for me, there's got to be a, a hard line taken by the club. But we digress. This is that's that's another <laughs> podcast, and that's a, that's another hour long thing. But yeah, um, look, I, I like Fulham at the moment. Fulham are the team now that I expected Fulham to be when they first came up. Not that absolute shower that lined up against Arsenal on that opening weekend and got absolutely butchered. Yes, so that actually conveniently once again segues into another point that I wanted to bring up, and it is Arsenal. And in terms of terrible performances 
the Gunners have almost been adverse to scoring goals and, and putting in any sort of something that we can be proud of as an as Arsenal community. But the recent performances from Arsenal seem to signal a turn of the corner. It's since the youngest players have come into the squad, stepped up to the plate, and the side looked much improved in attack. I'm reticent to say that the back line has improved because in the last six game weeks, I've done some number crunching. A lot of people are kind of spinning the story that Holding has returned and the, the side looks so, so much better. But I wouldn't say so. You know, looking at the fact that 1.6 big chances per 90 conceded over the course of the season on average, well, it's been 1.5 in the last six matches, 6.7 shots in the box conceded per 90 over the course of the season, 6.5 in the box over the last six matches and 1.23 xg conceded per match over the course of the season 1.29 so it's actually gone up slightly in the last six not saying the, the arsenal defense has improved for sure since the emery days and last season you know when it was dreadful but my point is is this kind of grand overarching story that holding is, is suddenly improved things i i'm a bit jury out on that one because I don't think I've not looked at the data to say see any improvement on the pitch maybe in terms of tactics and style but I want to focus on the facts that I have seen and the attack is so improved looking at the team as well that they're, they're enjoying their football again they look dejected before that there was a lot of frustration in the movement and that there wasn't creativity this is something going into last season, going into this season, creativity chances were a huge, huge problem for Arsenal. And we didn't sign a creative midfielder. But funnily enough, it seems to have come through the youth system. Smith Rowe seems to be that guy at the moment, which is great. And the other thing that I would say, some people would go, well, the big result, the 4-0 came against West Brom. But looking at the struggles of this season, last season, Arsenal have struggled against anybody and everybody. So I don't think this kind of argument that, oh, they've suddenly got an easier run of fixtures, but they did beat Chelsea and looked comfortable. So what I would say is uh, that the, the Gunners do look better. And overall, third for shots in the box over the last six game weeks, fourth best in the league for chances created, fifth best for big chances, uh, sorry, for big chance created, fourth best for chances created, and third for XG over the last six. I was I was shocked looking at this. I was thinking, we put in some good performances here, but will the data match up? And it does. So over the course of the season, on average, Arsenal have managed 7.89 shots inside the box. That's gone up to 10.66 over the last six game weeks. A significant improvement there. Uh, eight chances created per 90 over the course of the season. Now 10.83 in the last six. 1.17 big chances per 90 created over the course of the season. Now 1.42. And the XG has improved by a fair bit as well. 1.32 XG per 90 over the course of the season. Now it's 1.75. And looking at the difference between XG and XG conceded, that that gives Arsenal that little booster as well in terms of data. You, you kind of look for that, whereas before 1.32 XG scored and 1.23 XG conceded, you'd be worried. That's far too close to for comfort. That's basically saying that you're going to draw every game, and that's evidenced by the fact that the Gunners were winless. Now there's this little buffer. It still doesn't make me feel too confident, but the side do look better. In terms of assets, I think Tierney looks great. 14 chances created in the last six. And he's you know basically matching the other amazing left, uh, on the left, Scotsman in defence, Robertson. Smith Rowe averaging six points per game since he began starting. And he's assisted in his last three matches. He looks creative. And Lacazette is a differential. I think he's good to own for this blank game week. Not sure I would trust him the rest of the season. I think people around his price, maybe somebody like Martial, is quite good. But what are you feeling about Ben? Is is this just kind of a false dawn? Is this you know some short term improvement, or is there a genuine improvement both in tactics and data output there? 
Um, I think you have to be very careful in terms of look the young, you know, those young players are coming and doing an absolutely fantastic job. But what you're going to have is as players of, of this age, you're going to have inconsistencies, you're going to have fluctuations in form, um, dips in performances, and but at this moment, ten, you, you're almost riding on the crest of a wave, and everything seems to be going right. Maybe the fact that there's no crowd in the stadiums maybe benefit almost the pressure isn't there they have the freedom to express themselves to go out and perform without the weight of a home crowd 50 60 70 thousand you know supporters fans you know sets of eyes bearing down on them so maybe that's a factor um and i think you know michael arteta is a fairly astute guy and you know he, he knows what he's doing um and I think if you can manage this situation, I think the re-emergence maybe of, of, of Lacazette, I almost put Lacazette up there with, with an Anthony Martial. Now, he, he goes through these little streaks. When he's smiling and when he's happy on the pitch, you know, the goal's coming, you get the performance and he's involved. It, it's almost like it's all or nothing. He's involved in the link of play, he's involved in the goals. Or he does absolutely nothing. And by nothing, you know, it, it's a nine out of a ten, or it's a three out of ten. There's, there's very rarely is there any sort of middle ground. And, and like I said, at the minute is, is up there, and he's, you know, he's eight and a half, he's nine out of ten performances at the minute, and he's got to be worth some serious consideration. Um, I'm still waiting for Rabamian. Where is Rabamian? You know, I watched the FA Cup game at the weekend because it's, you know, it's our teams that were involved in that. Once again, I mean, he looks a shadow, you know, a pale image. Where is it? A facsimile, I think, of, you know, a poor facsimile of that of, of the Aubameyang that was maybe looking to earn a move away or sign a new contract for my deal. Um, but look, I, I think at the minute, we all know about FPL, you know, you know about the class. You know about all those players producing, but it's about buying in at the right moments, jumping on and jumping off, and that's what sort of differentiates, you know, the cream uh, with a little bit of luck. And I think you know, when teams are riding high in confidence, then maybe it's time to give them some serious consideration. I'm with the likes of Smith Rowe, Saka. You know, you'll get some good uh, offensive assets for not a lot of money. Yeah, this is the point. When you look at Smith Rowe, he's 4.4. He obviously no genuine consideration before this amazing run. But then looking at him now, hopefully he can keep his place because it's a bit like Saka last season. Now he's, he's a great own, but if he is nailed, I hope he is. And looking at the fixture difficulty for Arsenal... Again, they don't have a double game week in game week 19, so that puts me off a little bit. The run of fixtures are quite difficult over the next six. Uh, it's Newcastle in that game week 19, then it is Southampton, Man United, Wolves and Aston Villa. That's going to be real tests of if this attack is improved in quality. Um, just throwing it back to you again, Ben, any other points that you wanted to bring up? You know, we've gone through... Uh, two or three points of mine. Uh, is there any other teams, players that you wanted to bring to the fore here, just to to quickly discuss over in terms of FPL assets? Yeah, look, I think just you know, you know, we're tying in this this horrendous fixture period. We're looking at players, uh, maybe identifying those who are going to be playing in, in, the, in the double game week nineteen, and maybe planning with one eye on that. I think it's, it's reasonable to assume or certainly bear in mind that you're looking, and it sounds fairly obvious, but I will, you know, I will address the elephant in the room almost. Um, you know, pick players who you know, have a record of starting consecutive games. Players who you know are, are robust enough to be able to, to turn around and play within 48 or 72 hours of each other. You know, if, um, if you look at the likes of, say, Leicester, for example, you know, you would have a question mark before you even start with regards to Jamie Vardy, with James Madison, even with Fafana, you know, all players who we know are all managing 
problems. Um, you know, if you wanted to look at maybe someone like Callum Wilson at Newcastle, you know, you just look at the fact that uh, he was rested completely at the weekend as a precaution. You know, so maybe that should tell you, or that should set alarm bells that Steve Bruce doesn't feel that he's a hundred percent confident of him being able to play consecutive matches. You know, so those are the types of things that should come certainly factor into your thinking as we look ahead of you know, this double game week um, 19 because that's that's when you can really sort of steal a march on people in your mini league and, and, and make some serious, serious games. These are the times where almost you have the casuals that play the game, that can skate through it, you just forget to change their team and then forget the game of It's all right. But when you come around like game with 18, game with 19, when the casuals probably don't really fully understand and comprehend chip use, planning, foresight, and utilizing you know, the full strength and breadth of their squad, then you know that's where you can uh, either make up some ground or really sort of open some real estate um, over there. So I think that's you know, it, it's worth putting that little bit of extra time and, and effort in and around this team because um, you can really go through this. In terms of it as well, Ben, you, you're hitting a, a very important point with consistency with the players playing. And the, the next point that I wanted to bring up is I think that Treble City and Treble United assets are key, but it's hitting the right ones. I think KDB will play, Diaz as well. Cancelo is looking like a solid bet. A maverick move would be Sterling, who in his last six game weeks has five attacking returns. His only blank came against Manchester United. But obviously, I'm I'm going with unbiased data here. Uh KDB is the better pick if you're looking purely from statistics. But Sterling, you know, he, he has the form to back it. And it's when he is in these good forms, uh, good runs, is when you kind of want to own him. He's he's a very, as I call it, baconish. He's streaky. He's, uh, you know, one of those players that you have to capitalise on in the right moments. And then in Man United, I like Wambasaka a lot. He's got that ability to get assists, even though that's not really his role. He, he's more of a defensive defender rather than a TAA getting up there. But he does get up there every so often. I like Maguire. I know that's going to offend you a lot deeply to your core. But it seems to me it's almost like a, a when, not if, he will get a goal involvement. Because... He's getting plenty of shots in the box. He's getting the near goal involvements because he is the focal point of Manchester United's dead ball situations. And they've got really good deliverers of the ball with Fernandez. So I think that that makes it look to me. Obviously, Fernandez, we don't need to talk about him. He's he's essential. And then there's this debate between Rashford and Martial. Now, in in the data sense. I think Martial has been the better player. He's he's had more touches in the box. He's had a high XGI, and he looks good as well on the eye test. But it's the it's the double edged sword of Cavani is sniffing down his neck, and also the fact of the matter this whole consistently starting point. Martial just sometimes even needs to look at a pitch, and he gets injured. He he just floats in and out of fitness. There is no consistency with him. But when he's on form, my God, he is a great asset to own. So for less worry, more kind of headspace, you go with Rashford. But, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but if you want the Maverick move, go with Martial. He's looked good with manage Minich. I think he's got the high potential. He's got the higher ceiling. But Rashford, for this we're just talking about this blank game week, by the way. Rashford is the, the one to go for if if you just don't want that kind of looking at your phone and thinking, God, is he even going to start? I mean, do you kind of agree with all that with Man City and Manchester United? Yeah, I mean, starting with United first, I own Martial and, and Rashford, as we know. Um <sighs> Martial never, it doesn't sit comfortably with me. You never quite know what you're going to get. 
He's a player, I suppose, on the upside of it, on, on the positive, when he does return, it makes it all the more sweeter. When he gets his, his brace or he gets the hat rig, you know, it's it's expect it, you know, it's not expected, it's it's a it, it's a surprise. You can really sort of buy into it. You know, if Fernandez gets the hat rig, well, you know, you pay the money for it, you're expected. And you know, his ownership is is up there in the clouds. With Martial, you're getting a little bit of a differential. Um, and you're getting a little bit of a like an unknown quantity. Like I said, half the time it probably just depends on, on what side of the, the bed that he that he gets out of. The concern that you, you touched upon is that the Cavani coming off the back of a, a three-match ban started to look really settled within his role at United just before that ban, getting himself on the score sheet. Um, it looks like he's earned himself a new deal, another one-year extension. Ollie's been bigging him up again in, in today's press conference, Monday's press conference. Um, but, you know, given the fact that he has missed the last three, then, you know, I would fully expect Martial to um, to start in that one. And, you know, for City, one of the things that I, I instantly thought about there when you, when you were talking about, you know, tripling up on anybody is, I just thought COVID straight away, uh, you know, and, and, and we're aware of the situation, what's, what's already occurred down at City and, and having a game postponed and having three assets tied up in, in one club and a, and a fixture potentially being postponed could be catastrophic um, to your team. So there's maybe it's even just a reluctance maybe to go the, the whole hog in with um, you know in with any any club you know not just Manchester City. Um, although you are paying the, the major difference is you inherently you're paying a, a premium for those City assets. You know and. Again, the levels of expectations are that much greater because the the outlay is a is a, a lot greater. But one player who are, and this is typical May player, uh, <laughs> ticks all of the boxes. But uh, Ilka Gundogan is a, is a player who is 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 registered on my radar. Interesting. Uh, in recent weeks, um, who has been he's got a couple of goals under his belt. He's at a very nice price point. Uh, he's quietly going about his business, and he's, like I say, he's popped up with a couple of couple of returns. And I don't think he's a a, a bad shout. He looks. We seem to be seeing a, a more settled Manchester City team. In the past, you know, we've talked about well, it's De Bruyne, it's Edison, and then, but now we're probably seeing it's Diaz, and we're probably seeing it's Cancelo. And then we're looking, well, actually, is Rodri as well in midfield? Uh, and then if he's going to go Rodri, then he's going to play Gundogan. So maybe now we're seeing this, this upturn in form is maybe reflective, more reflective of Pet. Actually, well, I've got a better understanding of who my me, me best starting team is within the, the setup that I want to go with, which would be the, maybe the 4 2 3 1. Well, does... um, and, there is a bit of data to back that up there, you know, in terms of the Manchester City team. Gundogan has the second highest XGI, uh, sorry, the third highest XGI over the last six game weeks and the second highest expected goals of the team. He's got the same amount of shots in the box as De Bruyne over that time period. You know, there is a bit of stuff there and obviously he has got the three goals. that I think uh, a couple of the goals were kind of low XG uh amazing shots but still low low xg so it can't be continued but it's a 5.4 asset he will be in a team that scores a lot of goals just for me the problem with manchester city this season and it, it's because of the absence of the likes of aguero jesus not so much but even without a proper center forward or striker the person to put the ball in the back of the net the side of underperformed in terms of xg performances you know they continue to pass the ball they continue to create chances and have shots inside the box but they're just not putting them away and that is uh, a little bit of a problem and that does come into the captaincy choices but is there anything that you wanted to add with manchester city or did you want to move into the end run here and talk about captains 
and our teams. Yeah, look, uh, happy happy to leave City as it as it is. You know, I think I've touched upon some some of the what I would say the key areas. Obviously, the uh, the centre forward situation is is one to be wary of. Everybody would assume that Gabriel Jesus would come in and, and lead that City lineup, uh, and certainly in the absence of Sergio Aguero, who's now self isolating. Don't be surprised, even if if Jesus is involved, that he, he may not be playing that central role. You know, the Pep has other options at his disposal. You know, and 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 Mares can can quite easily play that, or Sterling, um, it, with Jesus just out a little bit wider. So, um, yeah, tread with care if the Brazilian is on your radar. <laughs> it's a it's a great warning, and we know how crazy some of the choices that Pep makes. He causes such fuss and worry for the FPL community. Kevin De Bruyne has been played as a false nine as well. Just to throw that in there, just to confuse us all. But in terms of the captaincy options then, Ben, I've kind of said I'm erring away from Harry Kane. In fact, my one is just going on Mr. Consistent, Bruno Fernandes. Uh, Yours is obviously going to be Rashford. But we're talking about the community as a whole here. I think... The ones that you should be realistically looking at are obviously Man United with Fernandez, City with Kevin De Bruyne, and Spurs with Harry Kane or Youngman's son. I don't think there's any other big picks out there. If you were to go with somebody else, I think that's far too differential. You're playing with fire a little bit, especially with how crazy COVID has been. I just wouldn't do it. And one of the most... Uh, differentials that you can do and we've said this previously but I'll say it again one of the biggest differentials is just getting your captain right if you can get your captain even just to score one goal each week he doesn't have to be the highest scoring player on your team but doubling up a attacking return is all you need just to fire up your rank just uh, a little bit every week kind of incrementally so out of those four choices there the Man United, Fernandez, City, De Bruyne, and the Spurs, the two of them, Son and Kane. Which do you like the most if, you know, taking out your Rashford situation? I've said Fernandez because of his data and consistency. Is that your choice as well? Or, or do you think De Bruyne is in with a shout against a poor Brighton team? Um, I'll probably address the Fernandez first because... This was a question that came up um, back end of last week and, and looking at Man United assets going to Turf Moor. Uh, and, and I think the question was posed that out of this week's premium assets who you would expect to return, which player do you think is going to bomb? And for me, going to Turf Moor, they've just been taken over. They've obviously got a, a COVID situation again going down there. Um, a number of players on the sidelines, on the you know on the crux of it, you look at that on paper and go, it's an away win. Banga Bruno always delivers away from you know, Old Trafford, um, but I've just again I've got a feeling that it's going to be that that Sean Dyche, that's that's you know that siege mentality where we just dig in, make it really difficult. It's going to be wet. It's going to be cold. It's going to be a horrible night. Um, you know. Players will be playing for contracts. There will be, you know, new owners they will be looking to impress. Um, and I think it'll be a difficult game for Manchester United, and I really do. Um, so based on that, and, you know, I'm taking the, the Spurs boys out of the equation for, for similar reasons. I think it's Kevin. I think, um, you know, uh, Brighton missing a number of players. Um, Brighton just... Flatter to deceive, you know, for me again. You have it how you're only unlucky for so long. You're only, um, you know, unfortunate. And uh, there's a point where you just go, Look, you're not good enough. And for me, I don't know. I think the starting 11 isn't too bad, but Graham Potter just likes to chop and change things around too much for my liking. You know, um, and I think we've got Tariq Lamptey, who suffered a setback. That's a big loss to them. And also even we've seen the emergence of Danny Welbeck. I mean, that maybe personifies, you know, uh, uh, 
that really tells us where Brayton are, where Danny <laughs> Welbeck is a, and, and, and no disrespect, but, you know, he, he's had his moment. He's, he hasn't really kicked the ball uh, or, or strung, a, you know, strung a, a number of high-level performances in uh, succession for a long, long time due to his injury. And there, there we see, you know, Brighton are, have become almost a little bit reliant on him. Now he's sidelined, so Connolly's out as well. So there's, there's some of their players who have maybe stepped up this season to date are, you know, are going to be missing. So there's a there's a pressure on, on, on a few of those you know, new boys to come in and, and hit the ground running. And I just don't think Brighton have what it takes to, to get anything against Manchester City. Yeah, it's. I don't think Brighton will get anything. The annoying thing is, it's just Man, Man City have not put their chances away. Whereas Fernandez, there's always that inkling that something will happen just the way that the cookie has crumbled for Man United, mainly because of penalties. And they just seem to get them and get them and get them. VAR is there this season, but there's always that thing in the back of your mind that it's Man United if a player goes down they are going to get the benefit of the doubt nine times out of ten. So just to summarise, let's go through our teams then, Ben. Can you talk us through who is in your 11 or maybe not 11 this week, uh, depending on the situation? And I can talk through, because I've got my eight or nine, and then I've also got my provisional free hit team. So there's kind of two teams to talk through, which is kind of fun. But let's go through yours first and foremost, Ben. Um, yeah, so as it currently stands, we'll be going with a 4-3-3. Um, and that'll be Leno in goal at home to Crystal Palace. So I'm fairly happy with that, although um, I do have Wilfred Zaha in midfield. But the back line of Maguire, Diaz, Loughton and Cancelo. We've seen Cancelo play a little bit of, a, of an advanced role in midfield as well. So that's, I think he's been a little bit unfortunate in terms of not, maybe not getting the attacking returns that, that he maybe deserves. So like, like that back line. In midfield, we have um, alongside Zaha, we've got Neto. Um, and he probably is one of the, the bright spots. At least he's, he looks nailed for game time, particularly with Prudence uh, ruled out through injury. And, and Marcus Rashford is me, me set and forget. Yes. In hindsight, not not the best decision I've ever made, but hey ho. Um, and then in attack, we've got Martial and Harry Kane. Um, and and at the minute, I'm sitting on. Well, uh, I've got a choice to make because the um, the four players that I've got currently who, who are free would be uh, Firmino, Chilwell, Ward Prowse, and Bartley. Um, yeah. You know, realistically, out of those, it would it would be Bartley would be the player to to make way, um, and that would mean you know I'd probably go with a four four two. Um, I haven't really given any serious consideration yet as to who I'd look to bring in. Um, I was I don't know I was considering Richarlison in, in the absence of, of DCL. Uh, as a possibility, but you know, he's flagged as a doubt as well. Although I do think the Brazilian will be involved, and I do think he will start. Um, just, yeah, I, I would have liked to see. You know, I think if Richarlison plays a, a more central role in, in, in place of Calvert Lewin, then yeah, I don't know if that's a good. Again, I don't know if I'm being lulled into this false sense of well, actually he's going to return and he's going to do really well because sometimes I think he does better off that left-hand side. Um, so we'll wait and see. So I'll, I'll, I'll wait until the team news comes in tomorrow. We've got a, a, another load of press conferences to come in. Um, and then I'll, I'll see, you know, I may be tempted by... Uh, well, actually, I, I don't know. I really don't know. It could just be... A put, I could just go with a punt on somebody like um, Smith Rowe or Saka. Uh, something like that, just a just a one game week pump because I, I could be free. I may even free hit in the double game week. I don't know. I'll uh, like I say I reevaluate at the end of this and see who comes through and see how the fixtures are looking. Uh, hopefully, nothing's affected. You know, COVID wise. 
Yeah, it, it's important at the moment not to, to do too many transfers too early because we've seen a lot of people have brought in Aston Villa assets in preparation for this and their double game week and then we don't even know what's going to happen. The early transfers at the moment, I mean, they've they never been a good idea in FPL, but this season is one for it. But if you can look on my screen now, I brought my provisional three-hit team up. And I've started with that because it's exciting and probably most likely what I will go to. So in between the sticks, I've got Hugo Lloris. I think Tottenham are a great side to keep a clean sheet. And that's also why Eric Dyer is in my back line. Then the rest of the players there is Diaz, Mr. Consistent. He is just starting for Man City all the time. Juan Basaka and Tierney as well. I think Tierney has been on great form in terms of creativity. And just bearing in mind that this is the free hit though as well. So I'm looking at that Crystal Palace game. There's a high likelihood of a clean sheet. But also, if there are goals, Tierney might be involved as well. Then in the midfield, I've gone with the punt of Smith Rowe. I think he will keep his place in the team. He's looked so good recently and exactly what Arsenal have needed. And I think the other sign is the fact that he wasn't played at the FA Cup, whereas the likes of William and Pepe were. And it was almost like they were giving Smith Rowe a rest. De Bruyne is back in the side for this free hit. Fernandez, and then Neto keeps his place just because I think, well, he's he's a fairly cheap option, and I think he'll play in that game against Everton. I'm not sure how well Everton will do. I'm not sure there'll be many goals in that game, but if there is for Wolves, I think Neto will be there assisting or scoring. Then I've gone with the very maverick choice of Martial in my front line. I just think he looks so good. And again, because it's a free hit, because it's for one week, it's kind of forgivable if he doesn't do well uh, against Burnley. But I think the ceiling is there for the ability for him to do bits against Burnley. I know you've you've given your worries about why Man United might do not do well, but I think they're the team in form. The data is there as one of the best attacks. And I think that the COVID situation at Burnley knocks them a little bit. I think, um, you know, Man United come into that as, as dead favourites. Uh, but then it does worry me because Dyche is Dyche. He knows how to play against these teams and defend. Lacazette is up there again just for the one game week. If Arsenal are going to score, he will be the goal scorer. Aubameyang just hasn't been near the goal, whereas Lacazette has had a fair few shot, shots in the box. And then Kane, again, he's had more shots in the box. He's had a higher kind of likelihood of scoring over the last six game weeks, more so than Son, even though Son has, has done very well himself. But the fact that Kane has had 12 shots inside the box, XGI of 2.33, it just makes it a little bit easier for me to own than Son, who is quite a bit lower with just 1.86 XG, even though he scored two, and he does always overperform his XG as well. He's he's consistent in that sense. Um, so that's just the free hit team, if I was to go for it. And then at the moment, my team is obviously McCarthy between the sticks, Stones, Bissaka, Diaz, and Dyer, Neto, De Bruyne, Fernandez, Martial and Chris Wood. Uh, so at the moment, I would be having two players not play, but I have taken a hit on that. So if I do play my free hit, then the hit will be taken away. I'll lose the transfers that I've done this game week just to explain the rules to people if they're interested. It just seems, I don't know, I, I'm taking away the hit, which could cause my rank to, to be quite badly hit. But then the flip side is I'm basically doing the free hit for two transfers and it just doesn't sit easy with me because all those players there in the team, apart from Chris Wood, um, they're good long-term owns anyway. That's why my team is built the way it is. I've got Robertson and Graylish on my bench. Again, good long-term owns. So I've, I've got a good team. It's just this obvious difficult game week. For two transfers, Ben, is it worth playing the free hit and nullifying that hit that I've already taken? Oh, I mean, it's a, it's a tough call. Um, I had two players in a minus four. 
worst case scenario, what you're looking at really a, a minus eight. If which you, you which know, isn't you, even you, that bad. You know, a minus eight isn't too bad because, again, I've got long term transfers in mind. You know, these are long term transfers. Uh, when you think about it like that, then no. But then, look, I think there may be. The problem is with in, in, in the current climate, we just don't know how things. And I, <clears throat> there's people who are just adamant of, you get let, let's use the chips while we can, because you know we don't know what's happening. The league may be suspended again, um, or or what have you. All these others that say, well, <clears throat> the chances of it being suspended again highly unlikely. There are certainly no discussions at this point and um, although players carry on doing what they were then it's almost they're becoming indefensible <laughs> yeah and yeah. you know you, it becomes hard to justify having elite level football when players can just have a blatant disregard to all of that so let's assume that you know the, the protocols have been enhanced within football and players will adhere to that and therefore, uh, I can see football continuing and I can see you know, holding on to those chips wherever possible. It's going to be a difficult game week for a lot of managers. So you wouldn't necessarily see the impact, the, you know, the full impact of taking a hit at this point because I think there's going to be a, there are a lot of managers who are doing uh, in a similar situation uh, or, you know, they're going to be starting with five, six, or seven players anyway. So, um, although it might feel a little bit counterintuitive, you know, going on the pitch, uh, cack handed I think sometimes, you know, you, you, you choose your battles uh, carefully and you just go with it. Go with it, mate. Take the plunge and just hope that, you know, I think one of the best returns this season I had when I always had 10 players, and it, it was one of the it was one of the best returns in terms of overall like game week rank. Um, it was unbelievable. I was like, well, can I play with ten every week? Less so, is more, mate. You know, with some of those exclusive Ferraris, the Faster <laughs> Rosa or something, where you pay a million pounds and it's literally an engine and four wheels. Uh, less is more. You know, you pay a million pounds. Exactly, man. <laughs> so uh, no, I, keep keep your chips intact. Go in with it and just hope that the boys who are involved do you proud and bring home the streaky bacon. Well, the thing is, I believe in my team as well. I think they're all good. I believe in them over the, the long haul as well. They're, they're players that are great. I've waxed lyrical about Dia, um, Diaz, Wamba Saka. They're fine over the, the long haul. Uh, the only one that concerns me a little bit is Martial, but I think... He's that maverick choice that I'm breaking away almost from the template. I'm I'm channeling a bit of you there, Ben, uh, which is... But I'm having a positive effect. Yes, you're, you're having a positive effect, rubbing off on me and uh, or all things like that. But I think that's a good point to end on. We've gone through a fair few points for Game Week 18 and we hope that we've helped with your teams. You've seen into our teams and our thinking. We've had the data, we've had the thoughts, we've had the feelings. And just again... Please do like, share and subscribe because we're going to be coming out with a lot more content in 2021. A lot of good stuff coming your way. Competitions, interviews and the like. We're taking it up a notch, aren't we, Ben? And it's going to be a good one. We certainly are. I'm really looking forward to it. Like I say, lots of exciting things on the horizon. Um, a different way of working. Hopefully uh, a better way of working. And... Uh, yeah, look, it's just a, a, a new focus. You know, we're, we're invigorated. We come into the, the new year. This is not just some New Year's resolution that we've, we've had on a, a whim. We've planned this. We've looked ahead. And, yeah, we we're really excited for, for what's to come over, the, over the, the weeks and the months. But for me, a goodbye and a good luck. And, yes, it's a, hopefully it's a green arrow from me and a goodbye. And we will see you, uh, yeah, 
sooner rather than later, rest assured.